sit here if you don't mind. I'm the liberal. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much to Premier Smith and Premier Mo for joining us. Uh, so today is uh, September 11th, 9-11. Many of us uh, know where we were on that fateful day. Uh, we still see a lot of global turmoil. Um, it seems, you know, disruption is the norm. We, whether it's the war in Ukraine or maybe escalating tensions in the Middle East. So I'm hoping both of you can share your perspectives with us, a high level on the global energy outlook. Uh, the, the Premier asked me, where were, you, where were you on September 11th? And I was, uh, I had braces and I was sitting in an orthodontist chair watching it on TV. So I think every one of us have a memory of it, don't we? Uh, I was also in the media at the time, so I'm quite happy to give some observations about how to get the message through. But I'm, I am so encouraged by where we find ourselves in the uh, energy space at the moment. I, I can tell you that I've been on a number of different, at a number of different conferences, and and I've seen some of the uh, the, the language coming out of uh, OPEC, and in particular Prince Abdulaziz. Uh, al-Assad, and he is very much along the lines of talking about reducing emissions, not production, which is exactly what we talk about. But more importantly, he and I also talk about energy poverty and, and alleviating energy poverty. We've got a dual role to play, I think, in our industry in making sure that everyone on this planet has the same standard of living that we do. And a lot of that is going to be related to the amount of energy that is produced and used in those jurisdictions. And so when I look at if we were today to have every person on the planet have our level of consumption so that they had our standard of living, you'd be looking at probably about 300 million barrels per day of production. Now, we know that's not going to happen, but that gives you some idea of where I think that we are going. I don't think we're at peak oil use. I know that they like to talk about that. I think we're going to find more and more efficient ways to use energy. But I, I think we have to take that responsibility seriously of making sure that we increase living standards around the world. And I, I think Alberta, Saskatchewan, Canada is going to be absolutely essential in being able to, to meet that need as we continue to see the increase in, in demand and, and the increase in consumption. I agree with all of that. Um, on September 11th, uh, 2011, I was in Vermilion, Alberta, actually. My wife and I, or, or 03, pardon me, or 01, pardon me. Um, I was in Vermilion, Alberta. My wife and I lived there for three years, and I worked in the ag implement industry there. And I, so I remember exactly where I was walking across the floor when uh, those planes uh, hit the, the towers in, in New York. Um, I, 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 the energy poverty, you'd use that term, uh, Premier, and... I just I, I look at that from a little different perspective, and, and when you think about wars, that war uh, was a, a little bit different, but mixed. Uh, but when you look at what's happening, uh, and I'll make a few comments on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, many wars are fought, uh, whether it be on energy or food poverty, on that basis, or what I call uh, a lack of energy security or lack of food security. And if you look throughout time, uh, that times of unrest are often based in in that space. And I think energy security, and I talk about uh, you know whether it's Canadian energy security or North American energy. Security, security is something that we need to uh, be discussing a lot more openly than we have been, in, uh, let's say, since about 2015. Um, it matters. It matters for your own general security. And if you look at what has happened, in particular in the Eastern European uh, countries, uh, what they have done is prance around the world uh, talking to talking down to other countries about uh, your environmental footprint, about your greenhouse gas emissions, and then in doing so, they pushed uh, all of their emitting industries out of their countries. Um, they didn't quit use, utilizing gas, oil, and coal. What they started to do is buy about 30% of that from Russia. Uh, they became energy dependent on Russia, which in the last couple of years doesn't look like a very good energy security plan. And I would say as we look ahead in this country and on this continent, uh, we should never put ourselves in that position, whether it be uh, in the production of our oil and gas, which is the most sustainable and ethical in the world, or whether it be uh, as we look to the future with some of the rare earths and critical elements. We shouldn't be uh, just absolving that and saying that, you know what, we're going to purchase those uh, from another country, namely China. And so energy security matters, and continental energy security for us in North America matters, and it needs to be at the very root of some of the uh, decisions and policies policies that we make at the provincial level, and I think it is. We're fortunate in the prairies, um, but it needs to be at the national level as well, and I think that's coming.
Yep, that's that's worth a clap. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I think you make a really good point about the importance of national energy security and working together nationally. Um, so what are you watching from the feds on the energy and, and environment files? Maybe do you have any breaking news you can happen to share with any of us? Or maybe there's things that us, uh, this giant room of energy advocates needs to be looking out for, like the surprise we got with C-59. <laughs> I, I'm looking for one thing, and I've tried desperately to work with the current administration, and I'm looking for a change in the administration. Um, that's it. Well, if it turns out that the bloc becomes the new dance partner for the Liberals, I'm looking for an early election as well. Like, make no mistake, uh, Yves-Francois Blanchet is hostile to our industry. He is very open about wanting to keep it in the ground. It doesn't, you know, the thing that drives me bananas about Quebec, and I, I saw this years ago, is that the very day that they decided to give an extra billion dollars more in equalization to Quebec because they had extra money left over and the formula allowed for it, that was when Francois Legault came out and said, we don't want your dirty oil, is how he, how he put it. And so to have a dynamic in our country where we have one province and the, and the political leadership in one province actively working against our industry, it's untenable. Um, so that is, that is one of the, the things that I think has is, is been problematic about the approach that the feds have taken for so long. They are, they are trying to placate a very loud, vocal, and I think increasingly minority in Quebec for political reasons without realizing or maybe not caring the impact that it has on us in the West, yeah, the impact it has on their own financial solvency because you guys generate a lot of money for us, but you sure generate a lot of money for Ottawa as well. So I would say that one of the things that your industry has done very well, and I'll give Pathways the, some, uh, some kudos for this, is by changing the conversation to say, hey, look, yeah, we want to reduce emissions too. We're able to have that joint conversation. I've talked about doubling oil and gas production because I think we can and reducing emissions. And we should be aspirational about that, based on my earlier uh, comments. We're, we're, the world is going to need more energy. They're going to need more energy from a reliable partner like the, us. The Americans are going to need more energy from us as, as uh, we start seeing a decline in, in their production also. So I would say our biggest threat at the moment is to see what kind of devil's agreement happens between the bloc and the liberals. And I, I hope that everybody will be very vocal in calling for an election. They have no mandate to, um, to be uh, creating a, a coalition government with, with, uh, with Quebec to extort money from Alberta and the rest of the country. We just, we just shouldn't stand for that. So I'm pleased to hear Premier Smith, I'm pleased to hear that you uh, consistently say that you want to encourage increased production. Um, so let's maybe talk a little bit about emissions here. So we know, I'm, I'm going to put this specifically to heavy oil, but I mean this does apply to the entire industry. So heavy oil does get a bad rap as, as being emissions intensive as it requires more energy to produce and refine compared to light oil. And so there are higher GHGs per barrel. So how do you see the Fed's oil and gas emissions cap affecting production in each of your provinces? Um, and maybe if you want to talk specifically to heavy oil. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to fight against the, the, the emissions cap because we know it's a production cap. We, we've seen analysis by various energy firms that, that do this kind of work that it would reduce our production by 1.2 million barrels per day by 2030 if it was applied at the rate that they're talking about. And when you think about that, looking at even at today's prices, where I think Western Canada Select is trading at around 52 bucks a, a barrel today, just do the math on that about how much impact that would have not only on on our economy, but also on our government revenues. We use those revenues to build schools and hospitals and roads. And so we, we will fight that because under the constitution, they do not have the right to determine what our pace of production will be, nor do they have a right to block us from getting our product to market. And we, we intend to, to fight that vigorously. That being said, 
Um, I see, uh, let me go back to pathways because I'm seeing them at the forefront of thinking through how do you get heavy oil production to be emissions free? And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about having a carbon trunk line where you capture the CO2 and bury it underground as one part. Another part is uh, decarbonizing through a different energy source at source, which would be, in this case, small modular reactors or maybe even larger modular reactors. And then the third example would be direct air capture. And there are a number of different companies. Occidental purchased up the, uh, the company that had been pioneering direct air capture, and they're rolling that out at many sites in the United States. And so there is a different way to be able to achieve that objective. The other thing I'd say about heavy oil is it is a beautiful product. You can make so much out of it. And when you look at, I, I understand, and I'm sure this room is full of experts, and you'll correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken, but I understand when, when China receives heavy oil, they use 60% for asphalt and 40% for diesel. So if you're decarbonizing on your production, and then you're using 60% for a, con, a construction material, you have already massively decarbonized that particular product. We know that carbon nanofiber is going to be another potential product that we can make out of it. And I have absolute confidence in your industry because I've watched it. I've watched you create 6,000 different products out of a barrel of oil. I have absolute confidence that we'll continue to find the best uses for this product. So I, I feel like uh, we're going to be able to, to meet that goal, not only increasing our production, but reducing our emissions. I'd say a like product, whether it's heavy oil, whatever the, the product is that we're producing in, in the Prairie Provinces or in Canada for that matter, it is the most sustainable and ethical product that you can find on earth. So just as a show of hands, everyone in here is involved in the oil industry in some way and outside of the media and a bunch of politicians. Um, you know, with a show of hands in the last year or two, you or your company, uh, put your hand up if you've been involved in any way in reducing emissions in the operations that, that you work with. And that's significant, and that's why you saw when Colleen uh, brought greetings yesterday, talked about an over 65% reduction in, in methane emissions in the heavy oil play uh, here in, in Saskatchewan, which extends uh, in, into Alberta. Danielle will say it's in Alberta and extends into Saskatchewan, but those are, those are, those are small points, um, but important ones, because I have the microphone at the moment. Um, <laughs> but show me another industry globally, in particular an energy industry, that has reduced their methane emissions by 67 or 68 percent in uh, relative to 2015. There isn't one. And so uh, kudos to you, to each of you uh, that are working in this industry, and my hat's off to each of you. And I would say that uh, not only are, are we as a government, and I think I could speak for both the Alberta and Saskatchewan government, uh, when I say that we are so very proud of what you do each and every day, not only on the production side, not only in creating careers for uh, people that we collectively represent across our provinces and across Canada for that matter, um, but we certainly are proud of what you do from an environmental perspective in, in producing some of the most sustainable and ethical product that you can find on earth. And we would invite all Canadians to be equally as proud of what you do each and every day uh, in this space for, for Canadians. Quebec, uh, Quebecers feel it in the, in the transfer payment. Ontario folks feel it in, in some of the up and downstream uh, supply chain uh, work that we do. And I think we should equally be proud of, of what you do each and every day out here in the prairies. Very well said. So what do you think is the right policy framework to support heavy oil production? And do you think that each of your provinces have it in place? And then are there any changes maybe that you think need to be made, particularly because I think we've really got to work on the lack of productivity, et cetera, that we're sort of seeing in our country due to the lack of business certainty and lack of confidence. I don't know if we should call it Abkatchewan or Saskberta. That's what I know that there have been conversations in the past about what would have happened if Alberta and Saskatchewan had never been separated for political reasons all the way back in the day. But uh, one of the things that that we uh, we have been talking about is as how do we create an environment where Alberta and Saskatchewan can work in tandem so that you're, those of you, and you feel it especially here, who are working cross-border, don't have to sort of explain to me why it is that Saskatchewan has so much better regulatory environment as I kept on hearing this morning as I was walking around the trade show. I mean, we, we know that there are things that we, we need to do. I think Dave Yeager was here at your last heavy oil show a couple of years ago. 
He has been my energy policy advisor since I was in politics the first time. He was Brian Jean's energy policy advisor. And now he's my appointee on the Alberta Energy Regulator. And you may have seen that there's a bunch of service guys <clears throat> who are now on the Alberta Red Energy Regulator on the board. And when I've been asked about that, I use Dave's line. He said, one of the things you can always account on with the service guys is when you call them, they pick up the phone and they answer you. And that is the culture that we want to have at Alberta Energy Regulator, that you will reach a live body and they will navigate through to solve your problem. And then we will, ta we will have efficient processes to get well site transfers approved in a timely way. And we will ensure that we have a reasonable policy when it comes to how much uh, may, methane do you ab abate? How clean is clean when you're doing your reclamation certificates? How is it? How how do we do the reclamation to make sure that you're repairing the land and getting it off your books from a liability point of view? So I, I think we've got a lot that we need to do on uh, on improving our regulatory environment. But I, I think one of the things that that uh, Premier Mo and I were talking about is how do we? I call this cooperation, where sometimes we compete with each other to get there first on the better policy. And then we can cooperate afterwards on, on uh, making sure that we, we can work together on that. So we're very open since we're just starting this process now. We have a new regulator that will be coming in. Uh, the Deloitte Persher has announced his retirement, so we are seeking um, an open competition right now. But this is the time for you to tell us what we need to do to, uh, to make things better, uh, like Saskatchewan, as I keep on hearing. <laughs> I'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> The, uh, as, as far as policy development goes, I, I think the first and foremost thing is to have uh, a good relationship between government and industry. And I think we have that on, on both sides of the border, uh, in particular in this oil play, but I think in the oil industry more broadly. Um, this, the second thing is there, there are differences. Is it, in Saskatchewan, as you, you know, see the, the Bakken play and it wraps around uh, the, the southwestern part of the province and up into the heavier oil play here, there's differences in policy. Um, approach in, in each of those areas and I think in fairness when you look at the oil sands versus some of the uh, the traditional uh, plays in Alberta those differences are, are very relevant and you, you do need to be able to be uh, nimble enough as a government and, and this is the challenge of the ministers of energy that we have is to ensure that they have that relationship with you folks in this room but also the folks in the other uh, plays so that the, the policy is matching um, the opportunities that we have to attract investment and there is some um, there is some competition in that space, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is provide uh, that sustainable, ethical, competitive product to the world together as, as Canadians. And so um, there's, I think that's about the relationship between the government and, and the industry. So each of you in, in this room and listening back and forth and you being bold enough to suggest um, not just whatever pops into your head, but suggest realistic solutions that are going to work for the industry, are going to work for the people that in, the, in the province or the nation that aren't in the industry. And I think we're, that, that works quite well. There's a regulatory opportunity that we have and I think this would be a good place to start that. Um, we're busy for the next six or seven weeks in Saskatchewan. Uh, we, as we have an election, and I, I'm going to come back to that in just a moment, but uh, um, there, there's some regulatory opportunities for us, and, and when people talk about interprovincial trade barriers, it's often regulatory barriers that are there, and they're not intentional, they're just that the regulations were made at a different time in Alberta than they are in Saskatchewan, and we have to do some work, and I think industry can help us to continue to do some work on aligning some of the regulations, whether they be transport regulations, whether they be uh, um, safety regulations, whatever that might be, and so there's more work to always be done there, and I, I think uh, we're, we're committed to, to doing that. Um, why uh, it should be Sask Berta, and, and, and why Saskatchewan is better in this space <laughs> is um, because Alberta took a four-year hiatus from common sense government between 2015 and 2019. Touche, touche. And, and I say that with an election on October the 28th in Saskatchewan that I would hope that we don't have to take that same hiatus in Saskatchewan because I have a feeling you might cruise right on by us. You know, you have two Albertans on the stage here. <laughs> uh, well, if we lose the election, we might have three. <laughs> I, I think we'll take him. <laughs> Excellent. So, Premier Mo, could you maybe tell us a little bit about um, Saskatchewan's plans to increase oil production by 25% with your new uh, multilateral well drilling program? 
Um, I'm, I'm interested in sort of some high level intel on it and maybe if you want to give us some specifics for heavy oil that would be great. What it is and, and, and anybody that you wants to know specifics about the particular program talk to Jim Ryder uh, right there and, and I'll say where this program came from but it's essentially a royalty incentive and this is an example of that relationship between government and industry. Um, so we're offsetting, essentially foregoing some future royalties to encourage some investments in the multilateral drilling space, which we think is going to produce uh, more of that sustainable ethical oil, put more people to work and ultimately grow our industry. And we're looking for ways to do that in light of a, uh, you know, a, fa a fa fairly um, challenging regulatory environment federally. And so what we're trying to do is to work with the industry and put all of the provincial pieces in place so that when that regulatory environment and that certainty level changes federally, that we have an industry here that is vibrant and ready to go. And I think the same is happening on, on both sides of the border. And so that's really what it is, is foregoing future uh, royalty revenues to encourage uh, that uh, drilling here today. That idea uh, and the premise uh, came from somebody in this room. And, and that's where the relationship is so important, is that industry is suggesting things to government. Government actually has a serious look at those uh, suggestions and where they can work for everyone, and they work for the benefit of not only the community, the industry, the province, the nation, and the world, uh, we move forward on. And so we can't move forward on all of them, but don't be shy with the suggestions that you have. Please bring them forward and be bold with them because I think that's where the success of this industry really lies is in that relationship between the industry and the, uh, the, the common sense governments without hiatuses. <laughs> that's a really good point. So that uh, segues kind of nicely into this next question that I have here with regard to revenue. So I think all of us on the stage here are quite happy uh, to have the Trans Mountain Pipeline operational. Uh, shipments beginning, or began in May of this year. Um, so how has the startup of that pipeline affected the provincial treasury? And if you could sort of speak broadly about um, revenues in general from oil and gas, and you can extend that into you know, your coal, coal, uranium, potash, et cetera. Um, I really think people need to hear the numbers, especially we heard from Mayor Elbers last night that um, Alberta's uh, healthcare budget is like $29 billion. So I think, you know, those kind of things really tie back in. Uh, Premier Moen, who I was going to be taking notes on his multilateral drilling incentive, so I see he didn't give me any details to take away, so I'll have to talk to Jim afterwards. But uh, from an incentive point of view, th that's part of the reason why our, our heavy oil industry exists, is we had the, the, the royalty framework that allowed for the companies to recover their capital costs before getting into payout. And so, and then we replicated that with the C-Star program to do the same thing for, for smaller operators. And it, it may well be that we have to look at those kinds of things again, um, especially since so, so many of the companies are now in payout, and you can see it. So. I believe we're getting $12 billion in royalties from, uh, from oil sands, uh, from sort of heavy oil, and then another $5 billion from the uh, conventional and, and land leases. So $17 billion is what we're getting in, uh, in Alberta on a typical basis, based on having about $70 WETI, uh, and then Western Canada Select as a discount from that. So that gives you some idea, and if our health budget is $29 billion. The people in this room are paying a large chunk of our, our health care costs, so thank you for that. You don't get thanks enough from the people who, uh, who are benefiting from that, and so I, I just want you to know it is, it is substantial and it's important, and I, I think that we have the ability to have the kind of tax environment that we do because of the investment that you have made, and all, all Albertans are, are benefiting from that. We had hoped that when the, the pipeline came on board that we would reduce the differential to $16 a barrel. That's what we were hoping we would see. Because if you recall, back in our darkest days, in the latter part of 2022, that differential was the highest it had ever been at $30 US a barrel. So for every dollar it narrows, I believe our government benefits about $600 million. So we watch that very, very closely. And so I was just looking at it today. I do actually look at the WTI price and WCS price virtually every day. Um, but we're, we're about uh, $13, $14 on the differential right now. So I'm delighted that it's narrowed that much. I, I, I'd be interested in knowing if anyone uh, felt like it should be narrow than that. My view is that it is a product that does cost money to get to market. It is more expensive 
to, uh, to refine it. And so I think that we would always expect that we would have a little bit of a discount on it. May not always be the case. I mean, I've seen some heavy, heavy blends that are, um, that are, are trading at or above um, WTI or Brent. So it may be as we go forward that, the, that we get a higher uh, value out of it. But I'm, I'm pretty happy with where we find the differential now. And what I like to see is that um, what I'm being told is, is that because we have that other outlet, because the, in theory we could sell internationally, I think that's going to create a lot of stability in that, in that differential. That's what I'll be watching over the next couple of years. Premier Smith and I were just talking about uh, this and, and sta the stabilization of the of the differential and you know is it at the right number or not we can discuss that but it is it is more stable than it was a few years ago and so the the, the egress capacity helps and then we were talking about Trans Mountain and KXL and uh, Energy East and the opportunities for that uh, into the future and I, I think where we are is a reasonable space but I'm very bullish on this industry and where we're going in the short to medium term, maybe the medium term. And I, I think we should all be very bullish on this industry because the, 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 the world is asking for exactly what you're producing. Um, and we are going to have an opportunity to move on, I think, a significant number of, pro of projects and a significant number of, of capacity, of product capacity that we are, are producing uh, in, in not only the Lloydminster area but, but across Canada with a, a little bit of a change in the certainty that's provided at the federal level and I think we should be ready to do that. And in order to do that, so I, I think where we are is fine, but we should look at the opportunity that lies ahead of us and that's going to need additional egress capacity and we're uh, a promoter even when sometimes uh, Saskatchewan energy products aren't in that particular uh, pipeline. We're a promoter of that because we need all of that egress capacity out of Western Canada if we are going to uh, stabilize that differential which impacts the Saskatchewan industry greatly. Um, so I, I think we need to start thinking about you know what those next projects are and nobody in Canada is saying that publicly except maybe the two folks on this, well three folks, two Albertans and one maybe. <laughs> On, on, on where this industry is going and, and, and what it's going to look like. We have a plan for growth that we put out, um, you know, it, it targets out to 2030. Uh, we have said we want to increase the oil production in Saskatchewan out to 2030. That's a little bit at odds with what you're hearing from most North American politicians today. Um, but I think the numbers that we have put forward are, are realistic and I think we can actually go uh, beyond them. We just need that little bit of certainty at the federal level. I think that's coming and I think we should most certainly take advantage of it when it arrives here in not only expanding our our, our production capacity, but ensuring that we're uh, very seriously and ready to expand some of the egress capacity so that we don't just find ourselves back in the you know, situation of the wildly fluctuating basis, which has a tremendously negative impact on the, on the industry as a whole. If I can build on that, I, uh, anyone who's from one of the, the Pathways pro, uh, uh, group, uh, group of companies will know that I've been asking them to go back into their archives and dust off any old projects that they've had so we can figure out how to get them to market. And I've been having parallel conversations with them, Trans Mountain, Trans Can or TC Energy, uh, South Bow, as well as Enbridge, about what can you do? How can you do loops? How can you do widening? How can you do compression? How can we take advantage of the existing egress that you have right now without having to do new greenfield development? Our, the feedback we're getting is that we could potentially get up to 6 million barrels a day of egress based on the current capacity that we have right now, just optimizing it. So we've got room to grow. I would also love to see a restart of some kind of project on Keystone XL. Maybe that route was not the right one. Maybe if they just twinned the existing route, maybe that would have been the pathway to go because we managed to get Line 3 and Trans Mountain done on the basis of using an existing right of way. Um, maybe we need to also have a conversation about restarting Northern Gateway. That would have been transformative to our industry. I think that was a 900,000 barrel per day project. It was approved. It had, uh, it had uh, First Nations ownership. And that would, that would be a massive game changer for our industry. So I, I think we've got to be aggressive. I think we've got to be bold. I think we've got to be talking in an aspirational terms to counteract the keep it in the ground folks who are trying to talk about winding our industry down early. Why would we do that? Why would we want to be the first jurisdiction out so that we become more reliant on Iran and Venezuela for our product? Why would we want that? And I can tell you, when I go to the United States, I make that case very boldly, whether I'm talking to a Republican or a Democrat, 
I say, we are here. We are your best friend. We have direct pipeline access. We are integrated. Why in the world would you be looking to anyone other than us to expand your production? And so I'll keep on putting that message out, but I think that we have every reason to feel optimism if we end up with some of the alignment that uh, Premier Mo was just talking about. Premier Smith, you have segued very nicely into my next question. Um, so you and I were both at the Canadian Energy Executive Association conference in Banff at the end of August where you spoke and you, you got great accolades, I will let you know. Um, you mentioned the possibility of resurrecting the Keystone Pipeline depending on who gets elected in the U.S. So this has been a very contentious project, we all know. So who do you think... Um, would pay for it due to the risk of it? You know, do you see a private company funding it or do you think government has to fund it? Well, well look, I mean, I was pretty um, excited to see that Hal Quisley has taken over the TC Energy assets on, on oil. And I think he's pretty bullish on trying to find a way to do the kind of things that we're talking about. And I think we have to be realistic. If, if we end up with a Republican in the White House, I think that we end up with the Keystone permit being signed into law the same day. I think that that is how strongly the Republicans feel about energy security. Um, if, we, if we don't and we have to wait a little bit longer until we have Pierre Polyev in Ottawa, then maybe we shift gears and start looking at Northern Gateway, um, especially if we end up with a, uh, a BC uh, Premier who also wears the Conservative uh, team jersey. So I think we have two incredible opportunities uh, ahead of us. That being said, we have a very good relationship with the current U.S. Ambassador to Canada, David Cohen. He came out for um, an event that we had during Stampede on transportation corridors, and he can talk about the stats of Canadian oil and gas better uh, than anyone uh, that I've met in America. He knows how, how reliant and how reliable we are as a trading partner. That said, I think we'll probably end up having more of a a natural gas discussion with America if it's a Democrat in the White House. Because I look at natural gas not just as a transition fuel, but as a destination fuel. If you build out the infrastructure for natural gas, that helps you build out the infrastructure for perhaps a future ammonia economy or methanol economy or hydrogen economy. There is no reason in the world that we would stop on the development of natural gas. And so, um, especially if you, if you pair it with, with carbon capture, as we're seeing increasingly. So I, th I think we have two different conversations depending on, on who's in the White House. But that being said, um, we are very good friends with America. Uh, we've had four years of Democrats in the White House and our amount of uh, bilateral trade has gone up. We have $184 billion worth of trade that goes between Alberta and American states. And I don't think that's going to change. I think it's only going to grow. We just have to make a slightly different argument uh, when we're dealing with the d Democrats, Republicans. With Republicans, you lead with energy security. With Dems, you lead with energy affordability. But in either case, we've got such a great story to tell. Fantastic. Well, we have about five more minutes here, so I'd like to do two kind of rapid fire questions for you. So the goal of this second last question is to give our audience three key points that they can use when they're talking with their family and friends about energy. So please provide three key takeaways with respect to energy in your specific provinces. The energy, Canadian energy is the most uh, sustainable and most ethical energy that you can find on earth. Second point would be people should buy more of it and we should collectively be proud of it as Canadians. We should be proud of how it's produced. And last but not least is rooted in every policy decision and every conversation that we have and the U.S. is here. We need to start talking about being energy secure in our nation. If you are not energy secure, you are not secure on any front. Energy security and food security are something I think Canadians have taken for granted and we just shouldn't. So I would say it's the, most, it's the most ethical and sustainable product that you can find. We should equally be proud of it across this nation and how it's produced. And last, uh, but certainly most important, is we need to talk about the security of our energy supply as Canadians. Yeah. I would just echo that. Uh, security, reliability, affordability. That uh, if we're talking about having an integrated North American uh, energy security policy, I, th I think we're winning. And, and I think that that is 
a message that can also assist our federal government in being able to achieve its NATO um, commitments of 2%, that we have to talk about energy security and defense support in the same breath, and the, the premiers agreed on that, is why we led so strongly on it, is we know that if we do not provide the Americans what they want, they are not going to provide us what we need, and that is open trade ties. Uh, reliability is absolutely essential, and I, I know that there are still, because I was at the Carbon Capture Conference in Edmonton, and one of the, you know, the lefty media, as so many of them are, cornered me and said, well, shouldn't it be solar and wind and batteries? Shouldn't that be what we transition to? And I have to say, no, because we believe in science. And what science tells us is at five o'clock in the middle of winter, sun doesn't shine and wind doesn't blow when it's minus 30. In fact, they have to power down the turbines when it gets lower than minus 30 because they will break mechanically. We also only have battery power that lasts for an hour. So I can't tell people at five o'clock when it's minus 30 in the middle of winter, hang on till the sun comes up at nine o'clock in the morning. So we know that we have to have reliability as number one. There is room for a responsible amount of solar and wind to be on our grid, but we also have to make sure that we are, we are investing in the kind of energy that we know will provide that reliability. That is number one. In Texas, where I just went down and met the governor last week, when they had their power outage, over 300 people died. And that is something that we have to be very frank about. This isn't an academic ideological discussion. This is a very practical discussion about our obligation to make sure that we're providing reliable energy for our people. And then affordability. We hear it all the time. You're probably hearing it on the campaign trail. There are a lot of really hurting people right now. And I can tell you this proof point because when we did a reprieve on the fuel tax, when Premier Mo did a reprieve, on the, uh, the natural gas tax. I'm still waiting to see how that turns out for you. He's already told me he's prepared to go to jail if, that, if it comes down to it. When Wab Canoe in Manitoba gave a reprieve on his fuel tax, each of those time periods corresponds with the lowest inflation rate in the country. There is an absolute connection between the carbon tax charged federally and the amount that we are paying for everything because every Every step of the supply chain to get goods to market just magnifies that effect. That's why people understand the connection, that if you're going to make every, the cost of everything more expensive, it, the, the, the way you solve that is by reducing the carbon tax. And I have to tell you quite frankly, I know people keep putting pressure on us to say, well, why don't you reduce your taxes? They should be reducing their taxes. They should not be cannibalizing our source of revenue that we use to pay for roads because they want to have an ideological tax that costs you about 35 cents a liter on, your, on every fill-up that you have. So it's why I have been um, uh, advocating against the retail carbon tax. I know Premier Mo has been advocating against it. Heck, even the NDP, who are the ones who saddled us with this kind of tax in the first place, have now changed their minds and are now advocating for a reprieve on these types of taxes. It's because it's bad policy. It doesn't work. It's punitive. And affordability has to be the number one thing that we care about so that we, we don't end up seeing middle class and, and uh, vulnerable uh, Albertans and Saskatchewanians hurt, because that's what's happening right now.